Good morning, everybody. I'm Jens Markloff, and this is my friend and colleague, Andrea Strömbergson. We've worked together for many, many years, wrote many papers together. And, but this is the first, of the first lecture in the series we're, we're going to give together. OK, so I hope it'll be entertaining. Um, now, this will be a lecture course about uh, homogeneous dynamics, which in the past 20 years has seen many very spectacular applications. Uh, in number theory and mathematical physics uh, and in some other areas. And the first lecture here will give a survey of the subject. Um, and then the plan is for the remaining nine lectures. These will be on the blackboard and will start from zero, from scratch, because I know many people here are not in this field and want to learn the basics. OK? So the first lecture will be uh, a fast outline of what's there in the field, and it's not necessarily going to be the topics that we discuss, but it's going to be sort of the, the historic highlights and some of the basic ideas. Now, who is a PhD student here? Okay. Very good. That's one third, maybe. Who is a postdoc? Very good. And who is a senior Academic, ah, modulo, good, yeah. You're the only one, it seems. <laughs> okay, so this is really aimed for the PhD students and also for people who might not be in the area, okay? If there's something unclear, please ask immediately. Raise your hand and we'll see you. We have four eyes, four, four eyes here. We will see you. Uh, if it's a question that goes a little bit further, then maybe you hold that back for the tutorials, okay? So let's get going. Uh, applications of homogeneous dynamics from number theory to statistical mechanics. So in this lecture, we'll first give you a little introduction about what homogeneous dynamics is. A particular important and powerful tool in this field is measure rigidity. And that's what we what will explain in the, in the second paragraph. Um, then we'll talk to three classic historic applications the, Oppenheim, the proof of the Oppenheim conjecture by Margulis, which was the first spectacular uh, use of measure rigidity. Um, then an application in quantum chaos will tell you about various applications, including uh, Lyndon Strauss Fields Medal winning work. And then we'll come to a, a set of very cute problems that are extremely easy to formulate, but very hard to prove. And there'll be a, an opportunity for you to, for those who are interested, to do some little numerical experiments with these very simple number theoretic sequences. And then finally, we'll tell you about what's coming next in the, in the uh, subsequent nine lectures. So what is homogeneous dynamics? Homogeneous dynamics uh, is a shorthand for dynamics on a homogeneous space. So what is a homogeneous space? Um, maybe I'll take the pointer. Yeah. Um, a homogeneous space is constructed by taking a Lie group G, and in our lectures that will be coming, we'll talk about very specific examples, like the group of invertible two by two matrices. And gamma is a subgroup of G that's called a lattice. So a lattice in a Lie group is a discrete subgroup so that the fundamental domain of the action of it has finite volume. And that's also something we'll, we'll explain, OK? You don't need to understand this now if you don't know what it is. And then you form this quotient space. So you form the set of all cosets, left cosets in this case. Um, and these are the points in this homogeneous space. OK, so that's an algebraic construction. And now we want to have dynamics on this homogeneous space. And the way we're going to achieve this is we're going to take a subgroup of our Lie group, a one-parameter subgroup that's generated by one element phi t. And then we uh, multiply the elements in our space from the right by the elements of this subgroup. OK, and that generates a map on the space. Um, parametrized by t, which can be either a discrete variable, in this case you call this discrete time dynamics, or a continuous variable, in this, in this case you call it 
continuous time dynamics or that would be a homogeneous flow. So that's the setting. And as I say in the tutorials and later we're going to talk through very specific examples, I'm going to talk about now I'll just flesh the, the most trivial, uh, um, non-trivial one. <laughs> so uh, you take as your Lie group G the, the real numbers. And the real numbers, of course, are, uh, to make it a group, you use addition as your group uh, law. So you can think of this as the group of translations. And then as your letters, you take Z, the integers, they form a group under addition as well, right? And then your homogeneous space will be the quotient R modulo Z. And do you all know what that is? Well, you take a fundamental domain, which would be the unit interval, and you just identify opposite points. So you get a circle. So R modulo Z is simply a circle. And that is an example of a homogeneous space. We will do a Godic theory, that is, we will talk about measures and invariant measures under dynamics. And in this case, a very natural measure is the Lebesgue measure, or in terms of the groups, that will also be the Ha measure. Again, we'll explain exactly what this is uh, in, the, in the next lecture. Now, to create the dynamics here, a particular uh, simple example that fits in as, a, an, as an example for homogeneous dynamics is taking phi to be translation by alpha, where alpha is a fixed number. And if, uh, uh, say, um, uh, an irrational number or a rational number, whatever you want, uh, you can take alpha to be zero. In that case, we just get the identity map. So that's a little boring. But take alpha to be you know, translation by pi, for example. Uh, then you get this dynamics, uh, which is just rotation by alpha on, of the circle. Okay, so that's the simplest example that we have here. Okay, so as Jens mentioned, measure rigidity is a really important concept or highly, attract, highly attractive goal, maybe, in, in homogeneous dynamics. So measure rigidity or rigidity of invariant measures, what it means, it, it's not a precise concept, but it means that the set of invariant measures for the given flow or the given map, this set is much smaller than what you would have expected from the definition in some sense, much smaller. And also every invariant measure has some kind of strong algebraic structure to it. So let me illustrate this in just a very, very simple case. Oh. Work, I'll do it. Now it works, okay. So uh, the case that Jens just mentioned the case of a circle rotation or a translation of a torus. So um, this is a very well-known equidistribution result. Let's consider this translation for an irrational translation. So alpha is irrational. And consider the orbit just of some point. Say the orbit of the point zero. This orbit consists of the points zero, alpha, two alpha, three alpha, and so on. And it's a classical result proved independently by, by Weil, Sierpinski, and Bohl more than 100 years ago that as we follow this orbit, it tend, if alpha is irrational, then this orbit tends to become more and more equidistributed on the circle according to Lebesgue measure. So in particular, what this means is that if I take any sub-interval of the unit circle, and uh, then as I follow the orbit longer and longer, I will visit this sub-interval. Uh, the number of times will be roughly proportional to the length of the interval. And another way of formulating this is that taking a continuous test function on the circle, then uh, if I take the average of the function along the orbit, this average tends to the volume average, or, or in this case, the Lebesgue integral of the test function f. So OK, I will just discuss this simple case in a way to illustrate measure rigidity. So let, let me outline two proofs. <laughs> Are you doing it for me? OK, thanks. So first the proof not using measure rigidity directly, just using trigonometric uh, sums. So this would be a, today this is a kind of standard application of harmonic analysis. It can be seen as a really 
a good example, very down-to-earth example of how harmonic analysis can be applied to equidistribution problems. So the idea is that take the test function, the given test function f, and expand it as a Fourier series. And then we just have to prove equidistribution for each harmonics individually. Because, well, for instance, by Weierstrass approximation, uh, finite Fourier series are dense in the space of continuous functions with respect to supremum norm. So it suffices to consider finite Fourier sums like this. And then by linearity, we may in fact assume that the given test function f is just one single uh, harmonics, just e to the 2 pi i kx. And we, for just that function, for each individual k, if we can prove this limit result, then we have proved the whole thing for an arbitrary test function f. Okay, and, and if k is equal to zero, this result is obvious because for any n, this is just equal to the constant value of the function. So then it's really obvious. But then the hard thing for a more difficult problem than this, this would be the hard thing to prove that every non-constant harmonics uh, that the sum tends to zero. Often then you end up having to bound some difficult trigonometric sum. You need to prove that this, for any given integer k, not equal to zero, that this tends to zero. Now in this case it's easy because it's a geometric sum. So we can just give an explicit formula for this sum. Here it's important that alpha is assumed to be irrational. So this number here is not one, so the denominator is non-zero. And the numerator is bounded in absolute value by it's less than or equal to two. And then we have this denominator. So clearly this tends to zero as n tends to infinity. So that gives the result. That's a simple proof using harmonic analysis. But another proof, thanks, uh, would be as follows, using measure rigidity in this very simple case. Um, then let's reformulate the problem. Uh, let's look at the, let's define new n to be the measure that you get by putting uh, the Dirac mass of weight one over n at each point of the, fir the first n points of this orbit. So in other words, new n is the measure which when you integrate the function against it, it gives just this ergodic average. And then the task is to prove that this sequence of measures, nu n, tends to the Lebesgue measure in the weak star topology as n tends to infinity. And so uh, recall that this space of probability measures, or, or this sequence of probability measures is uh, 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 locally compact, so we, um, so any sub, any sub sequence of such measures will have a sub sub sequence that tends to some limit. And that's, uh, using that fact, it's, it suffices to just discuss what can we say about a, a limit measure if I have a some sub sequence of these new ends uh, and this sub sequence tends to some limit measure new then what can we say about this probability measure nu? So here the convergence is always in the weak star topology. Okay, so, so then, what you, if, if nu is such a weak limit, then it's very easy to show that nu has to be invariant under the map that I'm studying, the translation by alpha. And it's just to, to write the thing out. Uh, here's written, it's written out in fairly detailed way, but, but the point is that if I, if I take a test function and I compose it with a map, and then uh, I apply new n, some, some ergodic average uh, with large n, uh, then this ergodic average is very close to, to the ergodic average where I took the f instead of f composed with t alpha. It's just some small correction terms. So, so, so it follows that new if, if now we are always assuming that nu is a weak limit of some subsequence of new n's, then um, we have, it follows that, uh, since I have both of these limits, it follows that nu of f must be equal to nu of f composed with t alpha. And this is just the same thing as saying that nu, if I translate the measure nu by, by my given map, then it's equal to it, I get the same measure back. So nu is 
invariant under the translation. Okay, so new has this property. And then what does it give us? Well, um, it follows that new is also invariant under the map composed with itself any number of times. So new is actually invariant under this discrete group of translations. And now it is a well-known fact, and this is actually easier than proving equidistribution, at least if you, in some ways. So this is, was known several decades before. It's due to Kronecker that, um, that uh, the, the, the point alpha, two, alpha, three, alpha, and so on, they are dense on the unit interval. So given any number on the torus, we can find the subsequence of n values such that n alpha tends to y on the torus. And then it follows that, that also these, if you think about the topology, it follows that uh, nu also has to be invariant under the translation by y, using the fact that nu is invariant under, uh, under t alpha raised to n i for all these i's. So actually, we've proved that nu is invariant under all translations. Uh, all translations, and then it's a, it's a simple exercise you do when you start doing measure theory to prove that such a probability measure, a Borel probability measure on the torus, which is, has all these invariants, that has to be Lebesgue measure on the torus. So we prove that any limit of some subsequence of these new ends has to be Lebesgue measure. And then it's a simple argument. This uses reductio ad absurdum, that actually it follows that the full limit must tend to new. Um, this uses the fact that any subsequence has a sub subsequence that converges. So it follows that, that then we prove that, that the, the full sequence must converge. And we again get this uh, equidistribution result. That was the second proof. OK. So the key point here was actually a measure rigidity. We proved that any Borel probability measure on the torus, which is invariant under this circle rotation by an irrational. Uh, quantity, that has to be the Lebesgue probability measure. And this is, uh, this is actually called unique ergodicity, that this circle rotation uh, is uniquely ergodic. I, I always think of Borel measures. When you start asking about not Borel measures, I am completely lost. Yeah, because the, uh, all, all the argument is based on your, uh, your, your test function is stochastic. Yeah, yeah. So you are looking at the yeah, I, I, <coughs> yeah, so in principle, some absolute. But sure, I, I mean, uniform equidistribution on, on the on the torus or the circle or whatever, that really has to do with the topology. I say for any open set or something, I want that. Yeah. And that, yeah. No, no, I continue. <laughs> so again, um, so it's a special case of uh, measure rigidity. Uh, here we had only one ergodic invariant measures, but in more complicated situations, measure rigidity gives us if we can prove it, it gives us that uh, the set of invariant measures is much smaller than what you might have expected from the definition. And, and every invariant measure has some kind of algebraic structure, as I said. And I, yeah. So now uh, that was a really simple homogeneous space. Here I will discuss briefly some more complicated homogeneous space that will play a really important role in, throughout our course, and, and this is also a very important for, for many applications uh, also that we will not talk about. So, so here's an archetypical example maybe that you are working on when you are working on homogeneous dynamics. Let G be the special linear group of n by n matrices with determinant one considered under multiplication. So this is an n square minus one dimensional manifold. And let gamma be the subgroup of such matrices which have integer matrices, integer entries. This is often called the modular group. And, and consider the quotient, so the set of left gamma cosets. 
Um, this, again, turns out to have finite volume with respect to Haar measure. So, so one can normalize so that the Haar measure gives a probability measure on this space. And on this space, there are many interesting, uh, interesting one-parameter subgroups that we can study the dynamics of. Here are the archetypical examples, maybe the diagonal. So any, take any diagonal matrix or any diagonal one-parameter subgroup and study its action on the quotient space acting from the right or take some unipotent group like this and study that one parameter group. These two flows have really very different properties and we will come to that. Okay, so, so the next. So one reason that this homogeneous space is so important for applications is that this homogeneous space where G is SLNR and gamma is SLZ, SLNZ can be identified with the space of Euclidean lattices so uh, Euclidean lattices in, in Rn. So recall that the Euclidean lattice uh, is uh, it's just uh, the subset of Rn that you, if you fix a basis, any linear basis of Rn, and you consider all the integer linear combinations of this basis, then you get the lattice. And uh, uh, for such a lattice, we, we have a fundamental cell uh, which is a fundamental region for, for Rn modulo the lattice. So there are two lattices floating around. One is commutative and the other is not. But, um, so Rn modulo L, if, if, if that has volume one with respect to Lebesgue measure, then we say that uh, we have covolume one. And, and the space of Euclidean lattices of covolume one can be parameterized by this homogeneous space where uh, G is SL and R. And, uh, Okay, I won't describe the details, but, but this is one of the reasons why, why it has so many applications in number theory, for example. Okay. Okay, so um, I think you have now an impression of what measure, rigidity, measure rigidity is about. Um, you've seen a, a simple proof of a classical equidistribution theorem using measure rigidity. Um, and what I'm going to talk now about is three spectacular applications of this idea of measure rigidity. Um, and again, this is just to give you an idea of the field. This is nothing we will discuss in detail later on. This is just to give you a little bit of flavor of, of the most important things that, that have happened. And the first one was Magulis' proof of the Oppenheim conjecture, which was the first application of homogeneous flows in a long, long-standing problem in analytic number theory. Um, and as well, quantitative versions of this, which uh, have been proved in the last 10 years, uh, um, have had a, a major impact in the, in the field. Um, and the reason is that analytic number theorists couldn't prove these things. They tried for 100 years, and they couldn't do it, okay? Only measure rigidity was able to, to solve these problems. So the Oppenheim conjecture is concerned with the distribution of values of a quadratic form evaluated at integer points. So you take a quadratic form Q. Um, could I just borrow the, ah, oh, there it is. So you take a quadratic form Q up here, uh, let's say in n variables, and we want to study in this scenario an indefinite form, which means that the symmetric matrix that defines the form has both positive and negative eigenvalues and no zero eigenvalues. So uh, if they're P positive and Q negative, you say the form has signature PQ. And we are going to look here at irrational matrices, which means that it's not proportional to a rational matrix. So if you take your, your matrix Q and there's no scalar multiple of it that makes it rational. You call it irrational. And it's formulated in this projective sense, of course, because um, the value distribution properties will not change if you multiply it just by a, a scalar number. Um, OK, and then the, the celebrated theorem by Margulis asserts that um, if you take an irrational form, any irrational form that's indefinite and has at least three variables, then you get values of the form evaluated at integers that 
get arbitrarily close to zero. Uh, in fact, he proves more. He proves that the set of values is dense in all of R. But this is the original formulation, and let me just write it down, okay? I'm removing zero here because obviously the form evaluated at zero is zero, so then that statement would be trivial. So what it says is that no zero integer, uh, that you can always find uh, a non-zero integer um, to get arbitrarily close to zero. Um, now, the assumption that you have at least three variables is absolutely crucial. Here's an example of an indefinite quadratic form in two variables for which this theorem fails. Um, and that's something we can talk about in the tutorials. It'll also become a little more apparent in, when I explain to you the, the, the approach of Margulis' theorem. So the first step in Margulis' proof of the Oppenheim conjecture was to translate the problem to a question in homogeneous dynamics, observation that goes back to a celebrated paper by Cussels and Swinnerton and Dyer, Dyer, Dyer in the 1955. Um, and that then was rediscovered by Raga Newton, who formulated very influential conjectures um, in this connection. Um, and Margulis' contribution was that he proved um, topological version of, of these Raghunathan conjectures. And here is how it goes. So um, let's first translate the problem into a problem of homogeneous flows. You already have an impression what homogeneous flows are. Uh, it's dynamics on a homogeneous space. So what is the homogeneous space here and what is the flow? Okay? And I'm going to explain this to you in the simple case of quadratic forms in two variables, two variables, and you immediately remember, ah, but that's the case where it didn't work, okay? But nevertheless, let me do that because the geometry will be much simpler. Plus, you'll also see where it fails, why two variables are bad. Okay, so first of all, um, we can um, bring our quadratic form into a simpler form by applying a linear transformation. That's basic linear algebra. So um, you know that you can di diagonalize matrices and can do all sorts of things. I'm not diagonalizing this matrix here. I'm, I'm bringing it in a particular form that's sort of exactly off-diagonal. And so what this says is we can write our quadratic form Q as a form Q0 with a certain uh, uh, linear transformation applied and some multiplying factor. Now we are interested only in the value distribution, so multiplying it by anything doesn't really matter. Um, and so now we have the standard form here, and the price we paid is that we have a matrix element M in here. Now the second observation is that if you look at this form, Q0, <laughs> this one here, it's invariant under a certain group of matrices. Yes? Namely, this group of matrices here. You've seen this group before in one of the previous slides, this group of diagonal matrices. Can everybody check this quickly? Right, so this here multiplies the x1 coordinate by e to the t, and this one multiplies the x2 coordinate by e to the minus t. And if you look at the form, they just cancel. So it's invariant under this matrix. So this is the orthogonal group with respect to this matrix Q0. So, the idea now is that in order to show that the values of this form can be arbitrarily close to zero when evaluated uh, along the lattice points, what we need to show now is that we've, we've replaced the original lattice C2 here by a lattice C2M, that we can find a lattice point, a lattice here with C2M phi t. We can multiply any phi t because it leaves G naught invariant, so that Q naught evaluated at this particular vector Y is less than epsilon, for any given epsilon. That's the idea, that's what we want to show. Um, and then the, the next observation is that this precisely holds if this orbit here, so now you think of this as an orbit in the space of two-dimensional Euclidean lattices, if this orbit um, is dense in G mod gamma, okay? 
Uh, and this is a certain, and this is now a homogeneous space of the type that you've seen before, that's SL2R modulo SL2Z, and we'll come back to that, so you don't need to understand every little detail. Observation three simply says, if you know the density of a certain orbit in your homogeneous space, then you're done. Why? Well, because what you can show is that if you're equidistributed in the whole space, you have the density of values given uh, automatically because um, whenever you put a, a very short vector in here, you will become arbitrarily close to, to zero. And so if your orbit is dense, it will come close to a short vector in your space of lattices. And that's the, uh, that's the observation. Now that's what Margulis proved for more than three variables. Um, but why does it go wrong here? Well, there are orbits that do not become equidistributed in, 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 in the case n equal to two. So we don't get a short vector, and these forms that lead to an m, the forms q that lead to an m whose orbit is not dense will be exactly counterexamples to the Oppenheim conjecture for forms with two variables. So that's the idea, okay? You take a, for, a problem in number theory, you translate it into a problem of equidistribution in a homogeneous space. You prove something about orbits in that homogeneous space. In this case, you only need density, need to prove density to get the density of the values of the quadratic form. Later, we will want more. We want equidistribution, not just density. Um, but that's the, that's the idea here of Margulis proof. Does that give you a little insight of what Margulis did? Yeah? Okay. I mean, I have to say, Margulis proof is extremely complicated. It's not as simple as this, okay? Uh, that's why I went to two dimensions, uh, two variables. Uh, and then there are quantitative versions um, uh, that I mentioned, um, where you don't, are not only interested in the density of the values of quadratic forms, but actually their quantitative equidistribution. So you're counting the number of lattice points in a big ball of radius t so that the quadratic form that you're looking at has values in some interval a, b, and you count all these, and you, you want to understand their frequency. So you normalize this by the, what you think is the right normalization, which is the volume of the corresponding uh, 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 geometrical object that is defined by these, uh, these conditions. And this wonderful proof of asking Margulis and Moses in, in 98 shows that as long as you have a form with um, um, more than four variables and p greater or equal than three, um, then indeed this becomes uniformly distributed. And only in 2005 they could extend this to forms of signature 2, 2, and um, uh, under certain Diophantine conditions on the coefficients. Very difficult papers and very difficult proofs. But the conceptual idea is exactly the same as on the previous slide, where you now replace the, equidist the, the density of certain orbits by their equidistribution, plus many beautiful technical subtleties that, that I won't go into um, now. Now, the, the reason why the quantitative versions of the Oppenheim conjecture uh, could be proved is a, an absolutely amazing, fantastic breakthrough um, of Marina Ratna. I think what, probably one of the most important theorems in ergodic theory in the last 100 years well, ergodic theory, I guess, is not much older than that. But this is really a, a theorem that is at the heart of measure rigidity and that has lead, led to so many applications. And without that theorem, uh, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today, that's for sure. I might do something else, but uh, nothing that, that beautiful. Um, so what is Ratner's theorem? Well, Ratner's theorem does exactly the same thing that Andreas told you about circle translations. Andreas told you that every Borel measure, every Borel probability measure that's invariant under irrational rotations is Lebesgue measure. There's no other measure. Now, Ratner's theorem 
generalizes this observation vastly to any Lie group, okay? And uh, a lattice, uh, so, and you, you take a lattice in that Lie group, and the circle rotations are generalized to groups that are generated by so-called unipotent orbits. And I'm just going to give you one example of a unipotent orbit here. Um, that's a unipotent orbit in the group of two by two matrices. And you see it's sort of got one on the determinant. This would be an example of an orbit that's not unipotent. And that's a, a very classic example of a very unstable mm, hyperbolic flow. And we'll, we'll discuss these two things in great detail in our lectures. Okay, So you learn all about these things back then. Now, what Ratner's theorem tells us is that um, when you have um, a measure on a homogeneous space, G mod gamma, um, that is invariant under a group of unipotent um, elements, and if this measure is ergodic as well, well, Forget about that. Those who don't know what an ergodic measure is, forget about it. No, just think of an invariant measure. Um, then you can actually produce a whole list of these invariant measures. It will not just be one measure, as in the case of the circle translations. It can be a whole list of measures. But these measures have a very, very strong algebraic structure. They live on nice embedded subvarieties in your... Um, homogeneous space, and they can be completely classified. So in these circumstances, you can do a proof that's very similar to the one that Andreas showed you in the case of circle rotations, where you say, I want to prove some equidistribution theorem um, of a sequence of probability measures that are generated by, these unipotent, by this unipotent dynamics. I prove that the sequence um, is relatively compact, which means you can go uh, and study limits of subsequences. And then if you can show that any limit of a subsequence is invariant under such a unipotent orbit, then you can use Ratner's theorem to look at the list that she gives you and just look at every probability measure in that list and maybe find some other criterion that rules out this measure or rules out that measure. And if you're very lucky, in the end, you only got one measure left. And then you're in the same situation as Andreas and the circle rotations. That's the key idea. Now, ah, OK. OK, so there has also been many applications of homogeneous dynamics to questions in mathematical physics in particular to quantum chaos. So quantum chaos is the study of how uh, if, a, if a classical mechanical system is chaotic, how is this reflected in the corresponding quantum mechanical system? Or if the uh, 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 classical mechanic system is not chaotic, how is this reflected in the, in the quant corresponding quantum mechanical system? So, so here's... Let me explain this in a really simple example, that of a billiard. Um, so, so the classical mechanics system then is just uh, that of a particle moving with constant velocity until it hits the boundary of the billiard. And then it is reflected according to the standard laws of re reflection. Here's one example of a the billiard, the so-called cardioid billiard. This billiard, the classical system has been proved to be strongly chaotic. It's Bernoulli, for instance. Um, so, so how is this fact reflected uh, in the, for the corresponding quantum mechanical system? Well, then we will be considering a quantum particle inside this torus, and, and this particle is described by its wave function. And the evolution of the wave function is given by the Schrodinger equation. If we just look at stationary waves, wave functions, then this reduces to just studying the eigenvalues of the Laplace operator. Uh, with Dirichlet boundary conditions. So, and, and since the region is compact, uh, this has a completely discrete spectrum. So we can just order the eigenvalues or the energy levels, if you want, of these stationary states, and, and, and we have corresponding eigenstates or eigenfunctions. 
And so, um, uh, in particular, one is interested in the high energy limit and how is the uh, fact that the classical system is chaotic, how is this reflected in, the, in, in these eigenfunctions and in the spectrum? So if we look at the eigenstates first, the eigenfunctions, then here are two examples at a fairly high energy or high uh, eigenvalue of, of such eigenfunctions computed by Arndt Becker. And in the left side, okay, so, so the physical interpretation of such an eigenfunction is that if I take its absolute value square, this gives a probability density for finding the particle in a given region. So in the left eigenfunction, it seems that this density is fairly well spread out all over the surface. And that seems to reflect nicely the fact that the classical motion is, is chaotic. But then, also high up in the spectrum, one finds these examples. Where, where the eigenfunction is highly localized. Here it is localized uh, around a certain simple closed geodesic. And uh, so, so it's a question what, uh, what, how should you, this is called scarring, by the way, scars, when, when the eigenfunction localizes uh, around cl some closed geodesic or some other shape, when it's not nicely spread out all over, this, all over the region. So that's a, one question. One can also look at the spectrum, uh, at the eigenvalues or energy levels. So I'd like to, I can't. Can you shift uh, to the next page? Yeah. So um, for the eigen, va eigenvalues at high energies, it's uh, been conjectured by uh, Bohigas, Giannoni, and Schmidt in 84 that if the classical mechanics system is chaotic, and we have some genericity, then uh, the, the eigenvalues should behave just as the eigenvalues of a large random matrix from the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And this you can study using various local statistics. So study the sequence of eigenvalues, statistical properties of this sequence uh, on the level of uh, uh, mean spacing one. So one such uh, measure is to just look at the level spacing distribution, so the distribution of gaps between consecutive eigenvalues. And if you study this distribution for, for the several first hundred eigenvalues for this cardioid billiard, it matches very nicely the, 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 what you would get for a Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. On the other hand, uh, so next slide, please. Yeah. Um, this is in sharp contrast to what one expects for uh, an integrable system, so a highly non-chaotic system. Uh, for if the classical mechanics is integrable, then it has been conjectured by Berry Tabor that generically the eigenvalues will behave just as the points of a Poisson process along the real line. So this would mean, for instance, that the level spacing distribution will be just exponential distribution. Here's one example for, by the several first hundred eigenvalues have been computed for the circular billiard, which is, of course, integrable in the classical mechanics. Okay. So next, um, let us study this for uh, some other billiards. Let's consider a hyperbolic billiard. So let us take a compact hyperbolic surface and play a game of billiards on, on that one. Now we have no boundary. So the billiard flow in the classical mechanics description is just geodesic flow on a hyperbolic surface. And this is well known to be strongly chaotic. And the question is, how is this reflected in the quantum mechanical problem? So then we are studying, again, eigenfunctions of the Laplace operator. Now it, this is the Laplace Beltrami operator for the hyperbolic metric. And uh, since the uh, surface is compact, we have, can order the eigenvalues. We have a completely discrete spectrum. And we can order the eigenvalues as a sequence of numbers tending to infinity. And, uh, um, so then the question is, what will the eigenfunctions look like? Here's one plot of such an eigenfunction at a fairly high energy level. Again, by, ah, it's by Aurish and Ulm this time. Okay, so, um, so we can ask again, will all the eigenfunctions at high and eigenvalues be, be nicely spread out like this one? Or can we have some kind of scarring? A precise formulation of this is as follows. Consider this measure. This is, again, the probability measure that uh, gives the probability for finding this quantum particle in some given region. 
uh, what are the possible limits of this sequence of probability measures as the eigenvalue goes to infinity? In fact, for a hyperbolic surface, if you want to switch, uh, it was conjectured by Rudin and Sarnak that the only possible limit is the hyperbolic area measure. So there is no scarring, no possible scarring as, as lambda goes to infinity. Um, so all the, these uh, Wigner measures become nicely spread out over the surface. And this conjecture is called quantum unique ergodicity. And this is still a wide open problem. It seems to be a very difficult problem. But still there has been some quite remarkable progress in special cases. So perhaps the most remarkable case is uh, what Elon Lindenstrauss proved. He has actually proved that quantum unique ergodicity holds for special hyperbolic surfaces, arithmetic hyperbolic surfaces. So these are uh, hyperbolic surfaces which come from some subgroup, discrete subgroup of SL2R which is defined by a quaternion algebra. So there exists such uh, co-compact subgroups of SL2R. And if we have such an arithmetic surface, then Lindenstrauss proved that quantum unique ergodicity holds. And the key feature in this proof is that such arithmetic surfaces possess extra symmetries um, leading to so-called heck operators. So there is one heck operator for each prime number. And the, the, the starting point of the proof is that, okay, we consider some weak limit of these measures, or actually the, of the lifts of these measures to the unit tangent bundle of the surface, these, uh, the so-called microlocal lifts. Any weak limit of these measures is known to be invariant under the geodesic flow. And that's a basic fact coming from Egoros theorem. But this doesn't give much information because the geodesic flow is highly chaotic, so there are many invariant measures. We do not have measure rigidity at all. So invariance under geodesic flow alone doesn't give much information. But the point is, in the proof of Elon Lindenstrauss is to combine this with dynamics coming from the heck operators. And then you, in the, in the end, it kind of proves a measure rigidity result for this situation. Okay, next. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so that is one uh, really central application of homogeneous dynamics, a really important application. Some other applications have also been given for the question about eigenvalues or eigenenergies of the quantum mechanical system. So recall Berit Tabur's conjecture, saying that if we have a, a classical mechanic system that is completely integrable, then the corresponding quantum mechanical system should at least generically, uh, the, the eigenvalues should behave like uh, uh, points of a Poisson process on the real line. Let's consider this for just the archetypical, oh, I'm using that word too much, but just the, uh, a really simple integrable system, the linear flow on the torus, then we are looking for the eigenfunctions on, uh, eigenfunctions on the torus. So uh, torus is given by the Euclidean space Rd, modular lattice. And these eigenfunctions and eigenvalues can be given completely explicitly. Uh, the eigenvalues turn out to be just uh, enumer we can enumerate them by looking at the so-called dual lattice. So, so the eigenvalues are now given by this sequence of lengths, or length squared, of all the elements in a certain lattice. So what Berit Abur conjecture says, that if, if this lattice is generic, then this sequence should behave like the points of the Poisson process. Um, but note that we have to, um, before comparing with the Poisson process, one has to rescale the sequence. If, dimension, if the dimension D is three or larger, then this sequence of points become, become more and more, uh, more and more dense, no, what is the word? The, the mean spacing gets smaller and smaller as, we, as the eigenvalue grows. So in order to obtain a sequence which has mean spacing one, we have some kind of unfold or renormalize. So we consider the eigenvalues raised to D over two. Then we get the sequence which has mean spacing one. And the question is, does this sequence behave like the points of a Poisson process? Okay, next slide. So in particular, the gap distribution should be exponential. We don't know how to prove this in a single case. I guess I switched to <laughs> next already. 
There are some other statistics, local statistics for sequences. You can look at the so-called pair correlation for the sequence. And uh, that means you do not only look at consecutive pairs, but you look at all pairs of numbers up to some within some given range, such that the difference falls inside a given interval. And for this pair correlation, uh, there has been some really nice progress, again using homogeneous dynamics. So there are results by Eskin, Margulis, and Moses, actually the one which Jens mentioned, because uh, the quantitative Oppenheim for a quadratic form with signature 2,2 .2 gives exactly uh, uh, this uh, a result on, on, on this counting function. So, so they can tell that for explicit lattices or explicit tori, they give explicit Diophantine conditions on the tori, on the torus, and then the eigenvalues will behave like the, the uh, Poisson sequences with respect to this pair correlation measure. There has also been a result by Jens for, for a slightly different problem. <laughs> I guess I have to rush a bit. Sorry. Okay, so you've seen two uh, uh, beautiful, or actually three applications of measure rigidity in this area of quantum chaos. Um, now let me just quickly go through uh, um, uh, another interesting set of problems which we can discuss in the tutorials a little more, as I mentioned, those who want to do some some uh, uh, numerics, and that's uh, about randomness in sequence uh, uh, modulo one. So what you do is you have a, a triangular array of numbers in, don't run away, <laughs> zero, one. So these are these sine j n. So for each n, you get n numbers, which you put in the unit interval. This is the unit interval. And you say, well, what is the distribution of gaps here? So what, what is the frequency of finding a certain gap size in the sequence. And then you ask, does this have a limit distribution as um, n tends to infinity? And in that way, you measure how random the sequence is. Because if it has an exponential limit distribution, you would say, oh, it's very random, right? Uh, if it has a very rigid distribution, then you'd say, oh, it's not so random. So that's the idea. And now the fascinating thing in this field is that we can't answer this question even for very, very simple number theoretic sequences. So for example, if you would choose your sequence Jn to be the fractional parts of J squared alpha. So this is fractional parts, and then you look at these numbers from 1 to n. Uh, and alpha is not rational. Say, for example, alpha could be oops, soft chalk, square root 2. Um, and you do need these numerics. Uh, you see that they, they look like an exponential distribution. And no one is able to prove this, not even the simpler pair correlation statistics that I talked about earlier. And some very, very good people have worked on this. So, including Rudnik, Sarnak, Saresco, Heath Brown. So, really, some of the top notch analytic number theorists. And Andreas and I have a dream. And you know what that dream is, right? To use measure rigidity to prove it. But we can't at the moment, at least. And it, it looks very, very difficult. Now, um, it's even more uh, interesting that. Even if you don't look at uh, something like this, but you look at fractional parts of small powers. So if you would take j to the one third, for instance, right? And you look at this sequence. Um, that's the first histogram there. That's the gap distribution for this sequence. So in each bin, you count the number of gaps that are fallen in a certain interval, appropriately rescaled. And it looks like an exponential distribution. Only if the power here is equal to one half, the distribution looks different. So that's a nice thing to, to program. It's a one line uh, or two line program in Mathematica or Maple. And so anybody interested uh, should just quickly do these things. So what, when the power is one half, the distribution is not exponential. And in fact, Elkis McMullen, again, to very, very um, accomplished mathematicians, 
have showed that indeed this limit exists and is given by some new non-universal distribution, which we'll call the alkes mcmullen distribution. And guess what technique they used to prove this? Ratner's measure classification theorem. So again, measure rigidity. Very beautiful. Um, so that's something we can talk about a little bit further. Uh, a real fun paper, Andreas and I wrote, which is great for undergraduate projects, is if instead you look at the gaps in the sequence log j mod 1, so you take the fractional parts of log j and you look at the gap distribution, you see these pictures here. Um, and the left one is for the natural base, and the one on the right here is when you take base e to the one-fifth, and you see it looks almost exponential, and we can prove that. And it's, it's, it's a very nice, simple uh, a proof. This one doesn't use measure rigidity. It uses Weil's equidistribution theorem, a higher dimensional version of what we talked about before. Okay, so... Um, oh, it's your turn again, Andreas. Yeah. I don't get a nice piece of the cake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just very briefly, I wanted to give an overview of the remaining lectures. So as we said, these will be on the blackboard with, with the chalk, all of the remaining lectures, not just breezing through as quickly as we did here. So we will start with several lectures going really down to basic things, just looking at the hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic surfaces and, and the group of isometries, SL2R, and then looking at the geodesic flow, horocycle flow, and ergodicity and mixing for these, and so forth. Then, in lecture four, we, I will, we will start talking about this space of, space of lattices that I said, the SLDZ slash SLDR, uh, and look at the geometry of this space at infinity. It has a somewhat complicated geometry at infinity and, and flows on these spaces. And then we will have some applications to distribution modulo one, as, as, which Jens introduced a bit here. And then um, we will have uh, some, I guess we can look at the next slide. In the remaining lectures, we will look at some applications. So, for instance, an application to the, the Lorentz gas. This is a point particle moving in, in an array of spherical scatterers, as in this picture. One can study the statistics of, of how long this particle travels before it tra hits the first scatterer and, and other problems. And uh, then we will discuss similar questions. So, for quasi-crystals. Um, yeah. and, and in the last lecture, all, again, up, other applications to additive problems, such as the problems about the Frobenius numbers, and problems about certain random graphs, certain ra very special random graphs called circulant graphs. Yeah. Okay. okay, just to conclude by saying that the next lecture in about 10, 15 minutes, uh, has been swapped. So I will continue with our first blackboard lecture, starting with some basics about hyperbolic geometry and SL2R. Um, and then we'll continue like this. Uh, and as I said, as Andrea said, uh, it's going to be blackboard lectures, which are hopefully uh, easy to follow. And um, I hope you look forward to those. Thank you.